Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 45 of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Before we get into the topics, uh, if you haven't already, check out the discussion video we did last week. Uh, we did a discussion video about art of exploitation and whether or not some of those older books are still relevant. Another discussion video will be coming next week as we're doing them bi-weekly. But yeah, just wanted to give that a quick shout out before we jump into topics. With that being said, though, we'll jump into some news. Um, so, ransomware attacks. So we talk, we talk about them quite a bit, and we've heard about them hitting hospitals before. Uh, this time, it seems that it actually led to a death uh, in Germany. So in Germany, there was a ransomware attack. It knocked out the Dusseldorf uh, University clinic systems, uh, which led to the death of the patient because they had to be taken elsewhere due to, I guess, protocols around uh, not being able to accept emergency patients where the systems were down. I th this is the first time I can think of where I've heard of an actual death being caused by ransomware. Uh, am I wrong on that, C? Have you heard of this, this happening is, before? No, this is the same for me. I think that's why it's gotten a bit more media coverage than a lot of uh, ransomware attacks have been. Uh, because, you know, this there is a death directly connected to this one. It does seem like the attack itself wasn't actually targeted to the university's hospital. They believe that they were targeting the university itself. Uh, when police contact, because the ransom message had contact information, didn't actually have a ransom. Uh, just said, you know, contact us, basically. So the police ended up contacting them, and uh, when the police informed them that it was a hospital, they gave the de decryption key up without taking any ransom. So clearly that wasn't their intended uh, target. They were probably just targeting the university itself. Uh, but yeah, in terms of your question, it is the first time I've heard of where somebody has died from one of these attacks. Yeah. So I saw a lot of discussion around this topic related to who should be responsible. I've seen a lot of people saying like the IT and staff of the uh, of the university hospital should be held accountable to some degree, uh, you know, like death by negligence kind of. So I, I did kind of want to get into a discussion about that because I don't know how I feel about that. So I once knew a person who uh, I used to work with at a, uh, like a completely unrelated job who was actually studying to go into the field of uh, med tech. And one thing I've heard uh, from him when he was doing some of his like, uh, you know, training and from other people that have been posting about the story is these systems are sometimes running on very old proprietary software where the companies that, you know, created the devices, they're, they're not even in business anymore. So obviously there's no support for those types of devices. So I think the issue is, is quite complex in that regard and that it's not as simple as just update to the newest systems. Uh, there's, there's a lot of code that can't easily be brought over. And I think that is something that a lot of people are kind of skipping over there. So I guess my question ultimately would be what ways could it have been prevented? Like, you know, Would you say I, there are strong practices that they should put in place and could put in place? It's hard to say. I mean, the medical industry is very regulated in terms of the security that needs to be established you know, around uh, any sort of patient information. It is a case where there is a lot of old software running. You know, you, it's similar to like ATMs, you know, running like Windows 98 or something or teller machines running that like. That definitely happens with the medical devices. There has been some move to update, but the update process is a lot more involved than it is with other software. When it comes to placing blame, though, the blame, you know, is squarely, I think, on um, is on the attackers. I mean, I don't want to, we can kind of say victim blaming here. I mean, to be fair, you can have kind of degrees of blame. I mean, it's not, it's not a binary thing where either they're at fault or they're not. Different things can kind of contribute to the issue. I don't know what the actual setup was here like for that university or how the ransomware actually got in. There, but generally speaking, like there probably are things that the hospital could have done. Do I want to place the blame on them, though, for being attacked? Not entirely. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to really argue because 
I think a lot of us that would be commenting on the story, you just there's there's challenges that come in that industry that we just couldn't really know about or in like the hospital space. Um, that is kind of one other thing you mentioned too is like there's probably a lot more red tape involved when you're dealing with this kind of stuff. Um, even if you want to push up, it's even if you have the technical means to, there's probably, I imagine there's probably like inspections and stuff like that that go on. I don't know for sure. Cause I've, I, I've never worked in a hospital. Yeah. So uh, my understanding with a but... lot of it is that they kind of get, um, they basically get like the existing software certified, um, in some way, like get it assessed. So then that is software is the software that they're allowed to deploy. Um, they can't just run an update uh, to kind of keep things up to date. So generally what they'll go after is trying to secure the network around all of those devices. Like my assumption here, like, I don't know what IT systems were actually taken down by this ransomware attack. It may not have been like these internal devices. It may have just been some that was connected to the internet, but um, I think that if I information correctly, would it was be administration needed. related think so but i'm not 100 percent certain yeah okay see because the attackers kind of knew they were going after a university it feels to me like there's a chance they might have compromised kind of the university network first and then decide to launch ransomware rather than just being like things exposed to the internet which means you know this is a internal attacker already kind of breached some of the policies that may be in place yeah um, overall, though, I say in conclusion, yeah, I don't think you could really put too much of the blame on, you know, the IT uh, and stuff like that. I well, think not it, without more information is really where you put it. Like, yeah, hospitals aren't exactly known for having the most amazing IT, but I don't just want to go look at this and be like, yep, hospitals fall, because I just don't have enough information to uh, say exactly what happened. Um, reading kind of the AP article here does mention that they found that the source of the problem was a weak spot in a widely used commercial add-on software, which didn't identify. So if this is a vulnerable vulnerability in a third-party software, what could the hospital have done? Uh, unless it was patched by the third party, you know, it could be something like that. It does say, you know, which it didn't identify, um, which could just be that the, uh, the person making the comment didn't identify the vulnerability or the vulnerability wasn't previously identified. So basically it comes down to nobody's perfect. So getting yeah, into some I exploits. We'll, uh, we'll move away from that. We'll get into some exploits. So this issue is a little bit old, uh, coming from August, but the white paper is a little bit newer, and I know you wanted to cover the C because you found some aspects of it interesting. So uh, yeah. I'll let uh, you take this one away. Yeah, this is the zero logon uh, issue. It is a little bit older. Um, but given that we were kind of away from the podcast for a while, I felt like this could kind of be an interesting cover end because the paper did just come out. Um, I'm not sure exactly when September, so it's close enough for us to cover, but kind of a fun vulnerability, I'd say. Um, if you're not kind of aware of it, like I said, this broke back in August where, uh, the net logon remote protocols, so like an RPC interface with Windows domain controllers. When you would log on, it would use kind of its own custom cryptographic protocol to do that authentication. Uh, you can kind of see some inspiration from existing ones, but effectively client and server would exchange these eight byte nonce values or challenge values. They both compute some session key based off that just using uh, key derivation functions so similar to a hash specifically for passwords meant to like take more time um and increase the cost of trying to brute force they both compute a credential by encrypting the challenge value with that key that they generate and then validate each other uh validate that both of them kind of use that same value so it's just a way of validating that both parties know a value without actually sending that value across uh, so they'd create that session key with that shared secret, um, encrypt using the session key, and just proves that both parties know that shared secret without acting to share. What was interesting here is this vulnerability used AES 
uh, CFB8 as the cipher mode. So an 8-bit cipher feedback mode is the block cipher mode. They're, kind of as an aside, they did notice that uh, 2DS could be used as an option, which, I mean, I'm familiar with DS and 3DS. This is my first time seeing some that use 2DS. That said, this wasn't the default option, although it's not vulnerable to this issue. Jumping back onto what the actual issue is, though, with the uh, CFB mode, um, I think they have a good diagram here. Uh, as with a lot of cipher block modes, you provide an in initialization vector, which is then used to kind of go byte by byte, just XOR again with the byte of the previous block. Uh, so the IV is used like that first block. So right off the start, you've got something unique. Or ideally, you have something unique. Uh, that said, what they found is Nethlogon decided, well, because the two clients need to be able to calculate the same things, they need to use the same initialization vector. So they just made it all zero or all null. Uh, you can kind of guess where that's going since you can also provide the challenge value is both null. Both of those values are null, so in some cases, um, the results will be a null block, or the, the result of the challenge will be a null block. Um, they figured about 1 in 256 chances the result will be all zeros to the challenge. Kind of gives the obvious issue of, you know, you've got a bunch of nulls to... Or if you send that null a bunch of times as your challenge response, you're able to pretend you know the right value because it's expecting all of the nulls. Uh, they do go a bit further in the document talking about well, going from spoofing just the client credentials, so pretending that they know it there, to what they can kind of do. Or will they get to spoofing an actual RPC call? Uh, some of the challenges there. But I thought the most interesting thing here was just the crypto break. It does seem kind of interesting that something as simple as the initialization vector could have been like messed up to that degree. Um, so they do point out there's no proof of concept provided, though there's definitely exploit implementations and POCs you can find if you go searching on GitHub and whatnot. Uh, I actually found quite a few by accident just searching for other stuff. Um, but another thing to note here is the patch, they also add some de defense and depth measures. Uh, forcing to domain join machines to use security features that were optional before, uh, enforcing secure RPC when using net login for like machine accounts, trust accounts, and Windows domain controllers. It'll try to protect devices by default or log events for devices that can't comply with that. And then I think in, in February of 2021, it's going to be taken even further to enforce that all devices respect it, regardless of uh, what the registry key is set to for that. So I kind of like that Microsoft is taking the additional defense and depth steps here. Uh, I don't think that's something you see incredibly often. Um, but the other thing that's cool about this paper is the issue itself is fairly straightforward, even though we're dealing with crypto. Uh, a lot of the crypto related issues you see can get pretty technical and mathy and a bit hard to understand if you're not in the crypto, you know, bubble. Um, but this paper did a good job, I think, of explaining the issue in kind of layman's terms. So yeah. I like that aspect of it too. Yeah, I mean, it is an issue that doesn't rely on a lot of math understanding. I mean, if you understand the XOR operation, you can kind of get how this happens when you control that IV and the message. It's all zero. So, of course, XORing zero with zero is still just zero. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've made a like CTF challenge, an old one that basically relied on this kind of issue. <laughs> Not not crypto specifically, but you know the XOR uh, thing you just mentioned. I just kind of remember that with XOR we issues. That. The, uh, it's definitely common in CTFs in general to have XOR issues, just because it's it's kind of a crypto primitive that's just really easy to do wrong. For sure. So, with that said. We'll move into Bitwarden. So we have two uh, Bitwarden topics. So Bitwarden is an open source password manager, which you can either have hosted or self-hosted. Um, and this first issue is a server-side request forgery in the icon fetching service, uh, which can be used to allow scanning of internal networks and stuff like that. Um, so they initially tried to prevent this type of issue uh, by resolving the host and checking for internal IP addresses on the icon fetches. So basically, uh, 
what the issue is here, you can set up a web server and set up a malicious name server on that domain. So you can create an A record that directs requests to localhost, for example. So they tried to initially block these kinds of attacks by, you know, checking for internal IP addresses, but it's it's basically just a blacklist. So there's ways around it, which is where this issue comes into play. Um, so they might check like 127.0.0.1, but they don't check 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0 .0 or some metadata API IPs that are used in cloud environments like AWS. Yeah, the so, key thing here was that, as you mentioned, the quad zero being one if I'm there, 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 being one they don't check, and um, the link local address, so that's 169.254, um, is the other one that wasn't checked as part of this switch statement. I've just pulled up the source. So basically, how you can exploit this issue is you basically add a credential with that domain to your vault with the malicious domain. Um, they also added a bonus bypass for what it's worth. They mentioned there could be a time of check, time of use issue. So you basically reply with a non-private IP with a low time to live and then reply with a private IP. They didn't verify that that's like a hittable attack, though, that that's all like theoretical. But they yeah, thought they included saw, it. I saw their inclusion of that. Um. I'm not entirely sure that that's going to be uh, possible. Uh, most, mostly because even if you have a really low time to live, that doesn't mean that insanely low time to live is going to be respected, especially when we're talking about basically sub-millisecond time frames. I, it, it's definitely possible. Um, I, I just feel like a lot of scenarios that low of a time to live isn't going to be respected. So one thing that I kind of questioned when I was reading this a bit is the impact is a little bit questionable because if somebody already has the capability to add credentials into your password vault, I think you already have bigger issues at that point. And that is kind of the only vector they mentioned to be able to abuse this issue. So I mean, that's I don't think you're really getting anything. But um, it, it depends on what the local network looks like that Bitwarden is actually deployed in. Like, what else is running on that same server? You know, if you're going to be able to access things running on local host, there might be something of value running there. There might not be. You can do a bit of a port scan. And I mean, all of your users, you probably don't want to just be able to do a port scan on local host. Yeah, um, it's like fair. that's I guess where it's kinda... a lot of the SSRF stuff comes down to is you can expose a lot of information. Um, you don't usually have a lot of control over the request being made, but you can kind of do that yes or no type question to them. Um, that said, like everybody on Bitwarden should not be able to do that. Uh, there was another bounty about a month ago of a similar issue. Um, so that's probably why Bitwarden also accepted this one. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I guess that is a good point. It is kind of uh, context specific there. So, to be honest, I haven't really heard of Bitwarden before. Um, I don't know how, but when I looked into it for the podcast, it actually looked like kind of an interesting, um, you know, offering. I think it, I, I kind of want to check it out. They do seem to have a reasonable, reasonably strong security focus. I like they the do. open source They're... aspect. Uh, the bounty program is really cool. Uh, it doesn't seem like they pay out on bounties. Uh, when I looked at their page, I think all of their categories for eligible things, uh, it says pay out ineligible. And this person didn't get paid for this bounty either. So it's not a paid bounty, but, you know, it's something. And uh, Yeah, I mean, if you want to look at it cool. because you're interested in it. Yeah. Um, that being said, my my security stance, I guess, on this kind of shifted a little bit to the negative side when we get into our next topic. Because this issue was getting a little bit uh, too silly. So they also had a desktop RCE um, to Bitwarden devs. And it's basically it's basically just their auto-update. You auto-update to RCE. Uh, they replace their own code with the, uh, with the update code. And um, it's just executed on the next launch of the app. And that code isn't, like, signed or anything, it seems. So... <laughs> Seems kind of. Uh... Um, it do I don't think it makes any mention about the signing itself. I but I mean this uh, issue is kind of. 
I mean, this is how a lot of update systems work, and it's calling it a uh, because uh, it does call out this permits the bit warden developers or anyone compromising or coercing those developers to backdoor a bit warden installation. Now, I can understand why you could have an issue with auto updates and not being able to disable them, it seems. That said, this does feel like a bit of a silly issue to call out. I mean, calling it an RCE does sound like they're kind of trying to play it up a little bit. Um, that being said, just because this is how update systems do work for a lot of applications, I don't think that means that it's really excusable. I think it, it's I think it's reasonable to expect a more robust update system by this point. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I come down on it. Maybe not an I issue. I mean, do you know if it's not signed? If it's signed then I'm not terribly worried. But I mean, again, being able to turn off auto-updates is something. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily say it's not signed. So, and in fact, I think as part of, um, and I don't see anything just in there, but I think as part of like the max update system, uh, I think things have to be signed. I think you can run unsigned stuff, but you have to allow it. It's like a... Yeah, so if this is signed, then it is purely the devs can put out code against their own system. Yeah, so fair enough. I will actually walk that back a little bit, because I'm actually, I'm not certain if it's signed. I'm, I was guessing it wasn't signed, but I don't want to make that claim you know, hardened stone where I'm, I'm not totally sure. So I'll walk that back a little bit. Um, yeah. Mika... I mean, if it's not signed, I can agree, but that's not some that's called out in this report. Yeah. Which is fair. Um, so Balika called it in chat. In my opinion, if the update is signed or comes with a secure channel, it's fine. Yeah. So t I kind of wish I dug into this a little, a little bit more now just to see if it's actually signed. Cause, um, that's kind of where my head was going when I was looking at this report. But now that you mention it, yeah, they don't call it if it's signed or unsigned. So hard to yeah, really I mean, make a judgment on that. For what it's worth, like uh, this uh, committer, like the guy who opened the issue, um, also opened one for like their web API um, of the same issue, being that when you make a request to like vault.bitwarden.com, um yeah this vulnerability exists at vault .com and is unpatchable by design because web applications default default to trust the validity of the application sent by the server it feels very like i mean it i think disabling auto update should be an option if it's not already with bitwarden like you i haven't used bitwarden i am a bit more familiar with it uh, but i haven't used it yeah so I guess I'll I'll shift my perspective back a little bit then, because um, looking at it more and hearing what you were kind of saying there, eh, this is a bit questionable as an issue, um, as a few of our issues are today, which we're actually going to continue to get into now. So our next one is PHP. So this is an open base dir uh, bypass, uh, according to the advisory. So it, it's it's a bypass of open base dir, which basically is to facilitate a, a sort of sandboxing on the file system. Um, if it's used, PHP will basically refuse to access files and directories that are above that specified base directory. Um, how this bypass works is it's it's kind of a symlink attack. Uh, you basically create a symlink to a restricted directory inside the accessible directory and then write to that file using error logging. Um, but there's a bit of drama around this bug because the PHP maintainers basically said this was not a bug. So this issue, if you decide that it's an issue, is technically a zero day because there's no fix shipped for this because PHP doesn't consider it an issue. Um, and I know this is where you kind of wanted to have a discussion on whether or not you think this should be considered a vulnerability. Yeah, so I do want to jump back, though, and talk about one thing that you have to You can't just create a sim link and it writes to it. It's not quite that dumb. Uh, you have to create folders underneath the web root that follow the same name of the web root. Um, so their example here, your web root is var or like slash var slash www slash html. 
you have to then make a directory under there of the same name. So you have the entire kind of file path being slash var slash www slash HTML slash var slash www slash HTML. You have to create that whole subdirectory. And then under that, uh, you can create the sim link into a writable but external directory. Use the dot .h axis. This is specifically against Apache. Uh, use the dot .h axis to set the error log value within that directory to write into the sim link directory. And then any errors written will go out to the error log file being external to where it should be writing. I just wanted to add that last, that little bit about the kind of duplication of the directory name. It seems like one of these systems may only be looking at um, if the string exists in there rather than actually looking at the root of the path. I, I actually kind of want to dig into where the cause of this one is. Um, because that, that duplication aspect is kind of interesting that that is necessary. Uh, but in terms of whether or not this is a real or significant issue, think about the level of access that somebody needs to exploit this. They need to be able to create those directories. They need to be able to create a sim link to a directory that they can already write to. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I figured you were going to come down on it was basically the high level of access needed to be able to even pull this off. Um, so that does limit the impact. Part of the reason I think it still might be an issue, albeit a low impact one, is they do mention uh, like on in the PHP manual, like all symbolic links are resolved, so it's not possible to avoid this restriction with a sim link, which indicates they do consider these types of um, attacks to be something they care about, or at least it hints at that. Yeah, well, uh, note that so... this does come through Apache. Um, I, I just, I don't know mm. if the only reason Apache is necessary is because of the HD access file, which is something you don't really have with like Nginx. Or if there, or if there's more of an application there. Um, yeah, but it does seem specifically, you know, it, you have to be able to set that error log. So would this work if you just made a call to change the error log folder? Or would that one resolve it? And it's just because it's getting set through Apache and not... Like, I have a feeling that's because it's getting set through Apache when it just passes in the PHP values. So would you say it might still be an issue, but it would be an Apache-specific issue and not a PHP issue? No. No, it would still be, even if it was, so I was just saying, um, it wouldn't be an Apache issue because they couldn't really fix it without going, parsing the PHP INI file, finding what that open base there's actually set to, and then doing work. So, like, that is something that PHP could still be responsible for. Like, on startup, it can process all of those links like it can process the error log and see where it's pointing to rather than just trusting it but the ability to set the error log is a pretty high bar so i guess where i'd come down on that is i i'd still be okay with calling it an issue but just a really low impact issue that's where i'd say so i don't know if i'd say not a bug I think there is something like... No, I mean, there's there's something to this. I even feel like there might be more than what was discovered here. I don't know. that. Like I said, that needing to duplicate the directory name is like a subdirectory. That's really weird to me. And I feel like whatever check that's for, there that might be... It's a code smell. It's something that's... I'm not... I'm not certain about. It's something that looks really fishy. Like there's some check there that it's doing wrong if that's what passes it okay uh, so like i agree like it, it is technically a bug i it's just it is quite restrictive as you've kind of mentioned um this is not something this is not a setup that just happens accidentally an attacker needs to kind of go through a lot of this and do a lot of this and be able to create those sim links write files that CTF could... challenge question mark yeah, I mean, it could be. We'll we'll add it soon to zero X. Yep, that'll be our next challenge. So anybody who's listening has a has a leg up there. No, probably not, but we'll see. Anyway, 
Um, con continuing on the uh, questionable issues train, we'll jump into mod security. So uh, this was a blog post put out for an issue affecting uh, mod security, which is a web app firewall. Um, and it's it's a regular expressions-based denial of service via the capture action, which I think we've covered some uh, regex-based DOSs before. Yeah, so. it's really common when you have these algorithmic complexity denial of service attacks that they exist because somebody somewhere either wrote a bad regex or allowed user-provided regex. Yeah, exactly. So... It, this specifically affects v3 uh, v2 quit execution of a of a regular expression after one match but v3 does global matching and that's one thing they kind of call out here is the fact that that behavioral change was made but it wasn't really uh you know noted anywhere in the documentation or at least they couldn't find it in the documentation um but i, I think we want to go in a little bit more into the meta details because this is another issue where Trustwave, uh, they refuse to acknowledge it as a security issue, and they refuse to backport a fix or release a minor version for the fix. They did provide a patch and fix it in the in the development tree so that the fix will land in the next version. They're just not like rushing a, a minor version to you know just address this issue. Yeah, they're not treating it as a priority, and I don't I don't know how I feel about like who's really to blame here. This kind of comes down to a question of. Like with mod security, all they've done is they now kind of do that global match by default. Um, so now they're able to do more capture. It, that is the other thing. It does fill the uh, TX variable beyond just the uh, 10 capture. So it does maybe do that as an undocumented thing. There is a performance impact, but at what point is a regression in performance a denial of service? it's still kind of doing what it's supposed to. So is a performance regression, a CVE worthy denial of service? Now, in fairness, like this is kind of a little bit on the extreme side because they're basically repeating an action that previously wouldn't be repeated. Um, that said, core rule set can start using anchored and they do use anchored regex, uh, which will match the entire string. And so with that, it won't it won't have any remaining substring to keep matching on. So like core rule set can create rules that aren't vulnerable to this uh, type of denial of service. So I don't know. I mean, it is kind of that question though. Like this is technically you call this just a performance regression. Is that worth calling it a CV? Yeah, so according to Trustwave, uh, no, because when you look at the timeline, they initially reported this issue on uh, uh, June 15th, I think. And then on uh, in August, Trustwave was basically stating that they dispute a CVE if, uh, if they filed for a CVE. So I, I don't think I'd mind it being a CVE. But no, I think I, to be clear, I don't either. I, I do think it, you can call this a CVE because you can clearly abuse this in a place where you couldn't before. This can be used to take down a server because that is a fairly extreme degree of performance impact. Though it does depend on you running a vulnerable rule. So I don't have an issue with it being a CVE. What I do have an issue with is the severity. They list it as a high severity right in the title. It does have a CVSS of 7.5. Um, and the metrics seem to be set properly. So I guess that would lead into a discussion around CVSS 3.1 and uh, questioning the, the weighting of some of the metrics, which I think we might want to get into a discussion in, in another time. But I this is one area where I think CVSS do, does fall short. I, I don't think it's fair to call this a high severity issue. Um, but I don't know where you fall on that. I guess it's because you the know, availability metric has so much weight. I mean, I guess the thing, and because the availability is also set to high, like it's none low or high. Uh, there's no kind of middle ground there. And it's it's one of those places where CVSS just isn't able to capture everything. So I guess the key thing here is, you know, attack complexity of a low is what was set for this one. The attack itself is 
fairly straightforward. It's just a spam uh, request that matches vulnerable regex. The thing is with that, you need the attacker needs to know the rule set that's running, needs to know that this sort of rule is deployed, which does that's beyond the attacker's control to actually control what's being deployed. And it requires some internal knowledge. That said, for rule set is super common. Um, like you could almost assume if mod security is in place, CRS is in place also. So I can understand that. But that is one place where you can maybe debate uh, the CVSS a little bit, having the attack complexity high. But it feels really weird to call a flood of requests a high complexity attack. Like it's really not. It just it does require that bit of knowledge that isn't really captured by CVSS at all. Like the effort that goes into discovering it i guess yeah so one thing i'll point out in this blog post that i did kind of like was although there was definitely a dispute you know between uh between the two parties it, it didn't really seem like they were kind of like trying to publicly shame them or anything they did kind of say you know we don't think it's their fault and we don't really blame them it's just a disagreement you know and different set of views so I, I do think that they were kind of um more even-handed than we have seen in the past with when it comes to this kind of uh these kind of disputes so i, I think they just they deserve a little bit of credit for that yeah for sure i think crs like handled it well they disagree but there wasn't like an attempt to stir up uh mob justice to get it fixed or something yeah, they weren't trying to inspire pitchfork mobs, you know, yeah. posting on Twitter. <laughs> it's like, um, I, I think it's fair. Like, I could see both sides of this issue. I could see why Trustway feels like it's not a vulnerability. It's just they, the performance has changed. I could see why CRS feels like it is because, you know, it's clearly like you can abuse this new feature. Yeah, it's hard to come down on either side. The only one I'd come down concretely on is the high severity, which I just don't think is accurate. But like I said, that that's kind of complex too, because then you're getting into CVSS. And I do kind of want to have that discussion, but uh, I think we'll we'll table that for another time. Yeah, I will mention that. I know when I would do vulnerability reports, I would usually take into account, like just because the CVSS was high doesn't mean I would actually report it as a high vulnerability. It would depend on the client. Some clients were very much like, you know, whatever that score is, that that is its impact class. But when it was up to me doing the report, I would take some of these things into account that maybe CVSS didn't capture and apply kind of an impact that I felt was appropriate. Uh, so it is worth knowing, like CVSS isn't necessarily the end all or be all of scoring these. And there are other systems too. Okay, perfect. So we love getting into low-level stuff, so uh, we'll jump into that here. Our first low-level topic is Beehive. So Beehive is uh, is a FreeBSD hypervisor. I think it's pronounced Beehive. I'm, uh, that's what I'm guessing, because that's what their logo is, too. Yeah, um, Beehive, or I think I first read it as Behave, but Beehive makes <laughs> behave, a lot more that's sense. That's too. So this one, I don't know if it'd be fair to call it trivial. Um, it involves instructions and concepts that are pre pretty low level. Um, you know, it's talking about like page table translations, host physical addresses and stuff like that. Um, but as far as technical exploitation of virtual machines go, I think it is a little bit easier to understand at a high level what's happening compared to some of the other issues we may have covered in the past. Um, basically, there's certain instructions in uh, AMDV and Intel's virtualization too, but this one specifically focuses in on AMDV. Um, there are certain instructions that operate on host physical addresses uh, because they operate on the host page tables. They don't use uh, nested page table translations. And some of these instructions include VM load, VM save, and SK init. And the problem with Beehive is they don't intercept these instructions. So you can abuse that fact and combine these instructions in a way that allow you to get code execution on the host. Um, you can basically pull an, er an Uno reverse card out and make the guest the host with complete control over the CPU core that it hits. Um, so it is worth noting, like I said earlier, <clears throat> these are AMDV instructions. So this issue doesn't really affect Intel-based systems. There might be like a similar type of issue there. I feel like this issue is one of those umbrella issues where there could be Intel ones as well, but it's just... Uh, 
you know, in this case, they focused in on AMDV. Um, but one thing I, I did forget to uh, bring up there was we have the Twitter link, but there's also an advisory that goes a little bit into more detail uh, from BSD. So they have, like, this is one thing I've always liked about BSD, by the way. They do have these, like, advisories that have background information, problem description, impact, solution. Like, this is one area that I think uh, BSD really, like, hits the nail on the head for how they put out their advisories and structure them. I really like them. So um, you might be able to glean some more information there if you're, you know, kind of interested in this issue. Yeah, I don't um, know. I felt like the tweet really captured everything you needed to know and that this uh the advisory didn't really include enough information about the issue hmm, so i mean the I, problem I guess... description here is pretty high level yeah it just says a number of amd virtualization instructions operate on host physical addresses I, I i guess a more accurate way to put it is i think the advisory has some useful information that might not be included in the tweet but using the both of them together you have like a a decent bit of information yeah and i will say like the tweet like when you're coming down on the side of is it trivial or not i think compared to a lot of similar attacks involving like escapes this does seem pretty trivial to just allocate the uh, gpa do your vm load and read the msr determine where the uh, hardware page is and then re-init uh, to basically, as you said, just, you know, suddenly the guest becomes the host. Seems like when you're able to explain it in a tweet and have enough information out of a tweet, like, that is kind of a trivial escape. I guess where I'd come down on it is it's trivial as far as VM escapes go, but it's still, it's not trivial, trivial in the sense that, you know, to be able to exploit the issue, you will need to understand some low-level concepts that a lot of people you know, probably aren't exposed to. Sure. So there but would I be mean, some, you know, you research kind of, that would need to be done on that end. You can kind of say that about a lot of attacks. Like, yeah, it requires the internal knowledge um, to discover, to pull off. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of agree. It It does seem trivial to me. That said, in all fairness, it's definitely not an area I've done any work in. Yeah. So, um... You know, wanted to shout that one out for uh, those who are interested in, in hypervisor stuff. Uh, I know it's kind of a, you know, field of interest that's been growing over time. Um, so let's get into a topic that I've been linked to probably about a thousand times over the last week. Uh, I joke with Z. Uh, if, if I got a dollar for every time this was linked, I could probably buy out Apple and just build, you know, my own version of WebKit and put it out there. So, yeah, so everybody needed to let you know that this vulnerability existed. Yeah, because it's a uh, WebKit. So this is a WebKit DOM-based use after free, which is pretty interesting. Most of the WebKit bugs I've seen over the last year or two are WebAssembly or JIT-based. Um, there's not really too many issues that are DOM-based and certainly not uh, JavaScript core-based. And the reason for that is just... JSC especially, um, but DOM as well, have been kind of picked over over the last, you know, five years or so. You know, you got people from Project Zero and they're like fuzzing setup and all that stuff hitting those areas to the point where a lot of the bugs that existed there are dead. Um, not to say that they're, you know, that code is perfect and there's no bugs there, but it's just a lot harder to find them there. Um, which is unfortunate because DOM-based issues and JSC-based issues are in my experience, a little bit easier to exploit because I don't, the web assembly stuff and JIT can get pretty complicated. I, I, I don't really know much about those, um, those subsystems, I guess. Um, unfortunately, I can't dig too much into the technical details because there aren't many here, really. Um, it exists in the URL object of the web template framework, specifically in the static blank URL object. It's a race induced use after free based on how page reloading is handled. But we don't have a proof of concept or many technical details beyond that. I mean, they do give you, I, I this isn't a write-up. I mean, you could look at this. If you don't know much, you might think like, oh, they're including so much stuff here. You know, if you're watching, you could see all the orange text. Uh, I mean, it's so much like technical looking things, but like this doesn't, you could work out actually a lot of details from this, but it takes a lot of effort to go from the crash information back to what the actual bugs are because this is just the ASAN output 
Yeah, past exploits that I've written, I've I like to go from POC like a crash POC to exploit, um, because then you know you can you can fire up like JSC or in this case you would have to fire up like a full browser, but you can go into a debugger um, and kind of play around. Whereas with this, you can't really do that because you kind of have to reverse the POC from the stack traces, which is you know it's it's not fun. Um, no, definitely doable, but a lot more effort than you really want to put into it. Exactly, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, generally speaking, you know, you start out with something else like a fuzzer. You're starting off with a crash dump, not necessarily a full proof concept. So this would be like that stage rather than the proof of concept stage. So they do mention that this can be leveraged to get code execution, which is not surprising. Browsers are such complex uh, beasts that many bugs are exploitable with enough effort. Even the tiniest corruption can give you enough of a foothold to create bigger corruptions in order to eventually establish better primitives. Since this is a DOM-based bug, you would have to move from web core heap corruption to JS core heap corruption. Um, it, that's, that's just a step, though. It's definitely doable. I mean, we've yeah, I, I've been involved with exploits that have done that before. Um, it will be more of a pain to debug, though, if you were to try to implement it. Because if, if the bug were in JSC, you could just debug JSC, which is a lot smaller and there's a lot less noise going on. Um, where this is DOM-based, though, you have to debug like a full Safari instance, right? Because you have to get like the HTML parsing and stuff like that in there. Adds more noise, makes it a bit more complicated to, you know, debug and stuff like that. Overall, though, I mean, I'm, I was thinking I might look at this issue and try to exploit it. But to be honest, I, I, I don't really know if I can invest the time at the moment. I mean, the last WebKit exploit I wrote, I'm pretty sure I invested like 14 hours a day for like two weeks. And I just, I'm not really, I, I don't really know if I can do that right now. <laughs> so out of curiosity, um, maybe you mentioned this and I just missed it. But um, since people were linking this to you, does this have an impact on the PS4? Uh, it's likely that it does just because where it's in DOM, I can't see why it wouldn't. It's possible the PS4 WebKit is old enough to the point where it doesn't, but I imagine it, it the PS4 probably is vulnerable. Um, I but I haven't confirmed that myself. Like I haven't booted up a you know a PS4 and actually, well, I don't even have anything to test. That's the problem. There's no PS4. So POC I did that notice at the confirm. end here they do talk about this POC.zip. But there's no link or anything. Uh, yeah. Um, my guess is that they just copy and pasted this from like a private report and they just didn't attach the POC for the public uh, blog post. Yeah, that, that's kind of like what I was assuming there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's hard to say for sure if it would affect PS4 without a POC, but I I imagine it's pretty likely. Um, and Balik is saying FYI 7.02, there might be somebody or people out there who have already exploited this issue on the PS4, it's certainly possible. Um, I'm not one of them, because I'm just... I haven't really been doing much PS4 stuff lately anyway, to be honest, so... Um, but, you know, that little aside out of the way, we'll jump into some more Apple stuff. So, continuing on the low-level train, we have an iOS info leak, uh, CVE 2020-9964. And... This is notable because this issue is something you can hit from inside of the application sandbox, which is very valuable. It can be chained together with another bug for a sandbox escape. And what's funny here is this seems to be just a straight up uninitialized read in one of the methods uh, used in the uh, service they mentioned, which is uh, forgetting histograms in the IO surface accelerator subsystem. Um, it, basically, they allocate a buffer and they don't zero it, and they just don't populate it. And it seems to be a pretty sizable leak, too. It's like hex 300 bytes in size uh, for the leak. So, you know, the article goes into ways you can abuse this and how to overlap useful objects to leak kernel pointers and stuff, um, which, you know, I'm not going to go into. You can you can read the blog post if you're more interested in that aspect. Um, but this is just another one of those cool kernel exploits in a product that normally has really complex exploits. And normally when you're talking about iOS, there is quite a high barrier there. But this is another time where it's just, it's it's pretty straightforward uh, to understand, at least at a high level. Yeah, it is kind of straightforward to understand the high level. The other thing is we often end up talking about code execution vulnerabilities. 
it's not as often that we talk just about these info leaks. Partially, I don't think they get written up as often because they kind of feel less interesting because an information leak, you can't do anything with this. Well, you, you can. Like, you use this as part of a much larger chain. So you might have your code execution and you would need an info leak to actually weaponize that into something usable. Um, so I think it's just interesting to have a decent write-up about an info leak to talk about that, to talk about, like, the... I guess you could call it the bit of heap feng shui to get things in order, things like that. Just to talk about that because it is a topic that kind of gets glossed over as, oh, and you need an info leak without really talking about what the process of getting one of those info leaks is. I did find that aspect of this one interesting also. Yeah, it kind of gets overshadowed. Um, I would like to jump back a little bit. Uh, Balika in chat said, uh, I didn't find time to turn my write what where code into a code exec uh, on 7.0. So I guess that does kind of confirm that that last WebKit exploit does work on PS4. Um, so I can give a little bit of insight into that. So the way that I um, went from write what where to code ex execution was I basically just uh, did a straight V table attack. I basically... Uh, leaked the JS object and faked the V table um, and just called the method to kick off a job chain and then kick off into ROP. It was uh, kind of a pain. You know, there was a lot of like intricate details you kind of had to work out. But um, in, in all honesty, you should probably just be able to port like kind of what I did on 6.20 up to 7.00. I think that code execution strategy should be relatively portable. So, you know, that's uh, that's something you could potentially look into. That aside, though, uh, we'll get into some of our research topics. So this is where we get into roulette. So this post looks into online gambling, specifically uh, tunnels in on roulette. So these kinds of online roulette sites are pretty popular. They used to be super popular with uh, CSGO until Valve dropped the hammer on all of that. Um, but they, they dive into multiple types of online roulette, and some of them I, I wasn't even really aware of. So some of them use like a real wheel shown live. Uh, some of them simulate with PRNG. And then the other type was simulating roulette with a physics engine, which I didn't realize was really done. Uh, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, you know, yeah, I didn't I realize learned. that either. Yeah. So uh, they talk about some of the like classic types of issues that can be present, you know, like SQLI or injection Um you know, availability of the number history for a DOS, which I think would probably be unlikely, or just straight up like analysis. Uh, time of check, time of use issues, like sending bets uh, concurrently to bet more than you have, stuff or like that. Or to get beyond like a table bet limit would be another place you could use that. I do want to add one thing on here though. They mentioned kind of the rounding errors, um, saying like, you know, normally only multiples of. Uh, 10 cents so i'm not sure if they're saying like literal 0. 0.10 cents or if they're trying to write that out as being like you know just 10 cents it's a little bit a little bit of a weird way to write or to use cents there instead of like 0. 0.1 dollar um anyway uh with the rounding errors it kind of remind me of another thing which is translation errors uh, I haven't done a lot of testing against the roulette system. This is just more kind of a number issue where one area of code might, say, translate a number one way, like stripping all of the non-numeric characters. And another area of code might do something like just a typecast to integer, for example, or float or whatever else. Might do a typecast. Like, there can be some differences there. So watching how those get applied and at least in PHP applications, using the letter E in your number. Uh, you can sometimes have a lot of fun if you have that sort of stripping system or casting in place along with that, because the E will be a scientific notation, so you can have like a really small number that elsewhere gets parsed as a very large number. Uh, that was just one thing I kind of want to add. It is a little bit PHP specific. I don't think too many other places will automatically translate scientific notation, but it is worth being aware of those differences nonetheless. So yeah, this, this post kind of just goes into like the general types of issues that you could find and uh, ones that are worth looking for. Um, and it's a bit more of a fun research topic. 
it's it's something that's probably been thought about before for sure but i i haven't really seen any public posts about or like diving into the way that this post does yeah i um, think it's somewhat difficult just because the law of casinos like if you're going to do an assessment with them you're also going to sign an nda not to talk about exactly what you learn they they don't want those types of issues really being publicly talked about for obvious reasons yeah um but but this post offered some insight and some insightful points on some types of issues that you can have. I think it's also very well illustrated. I really like like the diagrams and stuff they had. I think it definitely added to the uh, how understandable it was, um, even though they didn't go like super in depth into a, a particular issue. Um, this is probably of more interest right now, perhaps than any other time uh, where more things are going online, including gambling. You know, especially with the pandemic going on and stuff, you see a lot of casinos. I've been seeing a lot of advertisements lately for like online, you know, casinos because they can't really get people into the casinos or if they can, it's like a very limited number. Um, and, you know, who doesn't want to think about the possibilities of winning against the house, you know, um, though I, I will say you probably shouldn't try to actually exploit any of these issues if you find them in the wild and you're not like a you know, you don't have direct permission. You probably I imagine, shouldn't be finding them in the wild in the first place. Yeah, I imagine abusing these types of issues is extremely traceable, and uh, it's definitely fraud, if nothing else. So it's not something you really want to be caught doing. Um, so, you know, if if you're going to apply this, you probably want to apply it in like an official pen testing environment, not a shady, you know, trying to to compromise your local casino online website. So, another headlining topic, light hacking faces. So, uh, we're revis revisiting an old friend here a little bit, attacks on deep neural networks. It's been uh, quite a while since we've talked about any papers going into this stuff. Uh, this one is an attack on facial recognition or uh, verification using LEDs. So, we're not going to go into technical details too much because when you're talking about neural networks and the theory behind attacks, they do get quite mathy. Um, but the gist of it, as I understand, is basically just using stripe patterns to poison input samples um, and then identify images based on the stripes instead of the face or the yeah, target well, recognition software. I'll, I'll expand a little bit. I can't okay. talk about all the math behind the neural network or anything, but just expanding a little bit. I pulled up kind of the best diagram that I think they have in this paper. Uh, the idea here is to backdoor the training. Uh, so usually you give it kind of like your face input and it's going to learn like some details about that face. Maybe, you know, these pixels are always looking like this or whatever. Um, you give it enough training though and you include some sort of back, something that you control that it can train on. Uh, so in this case, what they use are the LEDs to kind of create um, stripes across the face. Uh, so that way the training system will go and it'll learn these stripes when it sees this sort of backdoor in an image. It'll associate it with whatever image that they were trying to train it with. Uh, that's generally how a lot of these backdoors work is by injecting some sort of ideally not super visible thing, but that the computer will detect. Because we've talked about backdoors before with things like antivirus backdooring by including certain pieces of data, like meta, meta information in a file. This is kind of along the same route, where you display these M, or you display kind of these RGB lights over the face, get that stripe on there, whatever else. Um, and then when the training comes in, you'll see the second example, the backdoor attack, they have a completely different face, but it has those same stripes on it. So it'll go and match with the registered face. Uh, so that's just the idea of backdooring it. I always find these backdoor attacks kind of fun, even though I, like, they obviously talk a lot more about how they got everything in there and how they did it, but it's beyond me to explain that. I just like seeing some of these and the ideas that people come up with uh, to actually backdoor the neural networks. Uh, success. So the success, oh, go ahead. So I, I did want to say the the. The backdoor aspect that I found really interesting was the fact that it's it's basically abusing the fact that cameras can perceive light at much faster frequency than humans can. So the human eye, they say, can see images about 70 images per second, 70 hertz, which I think is, you know, 
fairly commonly known just because of all the debates in the PC gaming communities about do you even need 120 FPS or whatever. Um, but a computer can see thousands of images per second, right? Kilohertz. So I think that's where they kind of go with pulling off this uh, kind of attack and where the backdoor aspect comes in. You can pull off the attack to fool the recognition system, but um, you know a person observing might not be able to see that because of that higher frequency that is just kind of outside of uh, the human visible spectrum. So I thought that was uh, pretty cool. I imagine you'd have to hide the LEDs decently well, because if you were doing this attack in the physical world, just walking around with a stripe of LEDs on hand is, is probably pretty conspicuous, uh, unless you're at like DEF CON or something. But um, yeah, I think that was that was kind of the most interesting part of the attack for me. Yeah, I mean, that's like I was just saying, that's kind of one of the things I like here is just seeing how they decide to try and hide their back door and stuff, too. Um, yeah, I agree there. The success rate here uh, wasn't amazing on the verification. Uh, I think they got it up here, the attack, up to like 50% on a color image, only just under 20% on a uh, black and white image. Or, ver or a four-phase verification. I mean, it, it's low, but at the same time, you can usually make at least a couple attempts, so it's high enough. So I think those success rates were virtual, but I could be wrong because they did post a, a different set of results for physical tests based on uh, Samsung Galaxy and Huawei facial verification. And those success rates were a little bit lower. They were like 0.2 to 0.4. Um, in those measured results um now while that is low like you said generally you know if you're closer to like 0.4 then when you go to pull off these attacks you can usually try facial verification like two or three times i think before it'll basically fall back on like a pin or something like that so you know it, it's 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 low but it's not unrealistically low to the point where the attack is dead in the physical world yeah i think the bigger issue is like you said actually pulling this off like actually having the leds to get a training image in there um yeah I, I feel like that's going to be a lot harder than the actual success rate of the attack so the mitigation they proposed here was pretty simple it was basically just using machine learning to reject and remove malicious samples i think they call it de-striping since their attack is based on stripes so um, you know, I think that's pretty similar to some of the other attacks and proposed solutions that we've seen with, uh, you know, poisoning or backdoor poisoning based attacks on neural networks. So, yeah, it seems like, you know, they just need to get trained on adversarial images. I mean, exactly. I say that as they just need to do that, but that seems to be the case with a lot <laughs> as of if these it's, uh, super easy. <laughs> they need the training that takes into account any sort of adversarial, not just the striving, because I'm sure somebody will figure something else out, too. It just needs to be able to deal with, like, more noise in an image. And by noise, I don't necessarily mean literal noise, though it can include that, but just more unexpected inputs. All right, so let's move into our next paper, which is fuzzing-oriented. Uh, actually, our next two papers are both fuzzing-oriented. So this one is called Unifuzz, um, Optimized Distributed Fuzzing, Distributed Fuzzing, via dynamic centralized task scheduling. So it, it talks about trying to tackle parallel computing in the area of fuzzing to try to improve performance and uh, some of the challenges that come with that. So the four major challenges they highlight there are synchronization, so like sharing seeds and coverage reports, which can be slow, task conflicts, um, you know, different seeds and different mutations could provide the same type of tests. Um, workload imbalance, so varying computer like computing abilities of boxes that are in the cluster and scalability um, because seed evaluation and whatnot can get quite tricky when you have a lot of fuzzing agents running you kind of get that like state explosion aspect uh, that you have to manage so here they present their own um, you know fuzzing setup which they call unifuzz uh, which uses dynamic centralized task scheduling so figure one on page four probably has the best uh, overview, I think, when it comes to the architecture of what they're doing here. Uh, let me just uh, scroll over to that. I think you pulled it up there, Z. So basically, it seems they assign an evaluation instance for each fuzzing instance, and then those groups share seeds between each other 
um, and then propagate them back up to the main scheduler, which handles the assignment of uh, the seeds and fuzzing tasks. So actually, one thing that is worth noting is I believe they can, uh, the scheduler can dynamically change whether something's in evaluation or fuzzing. Uh, that was some that they pulled in terms of the workload imbalance when needed. They can switch what task something is doing. Oh, okay. I didn't pick up on that point. So, yeah, good, uh, good show. So, um, my thoughts on this. I mean, you can go in deeper into like the architecture that they have here if you're interested. Um, when I first saw this paper, when I saw the mention of parallel computing, I thought they were talking about leveraging like GPUs or something like that for fuzzing, which I actually I I kind of been discussing about with some other people lately just how like viable it would be and where you would use it um so that's what i was kind of hoping it was um but that's that's not what it ended up being i'm not really sure how you do that in like a task scheduling context uh, you might be able to do that in like a task scheduling context with like leveraging gpus um you know fuzzing isn't really math intensive so paralyzing parallelizing that with gpus would be kind of difficult unless you used ai and uh, you know, put your put your fuzzer in the blockchain, but you know, this this is still kind of an interesting paper, though I I don't know how much of it is really novel. I think there are concepts that they use here that kind of have been used already in other fuzzers. Maybe not AFL, which is kind of what they're comparing against, but you know, I don't think there's too much that's super novel here. Um, that being said, they do, you know, they do have some results to back it up. They have 14 real world findings, uh, which they have listed in there. Now, I, I am the findings. They're in the standard set of programs we've seen in like fuzzing related papers before, you know, free, ta uh, free type, libcxx, readelf, ffmpeg. Um, these are definitely real world programs, but it's not where the cutting edge fuzzing is happening, really, which is why i'm not a huge fan of their like selection for results for these papers yeah well i feel like there's also just the issue of using a vulnerability count as their metric in the first place you're talking about the scheduler i feel like they should be talking more about test cases generated uh what's the throughput oh you know i feel like there would have been a better metric for them to use than just Findings like a lot of times with fuzzers, I do think you know finding is the right, uh, is the right metric. It's just this one is specifically it's less about the findings and it's more about the speed at which it's able to go through. And they do talk about that, uh, but they don't provide a. I don't think they provided a very good comparison. Uh, like you mentioned though, jumping back on the how novel this is, it is a kind of straightforward thing. It just they introduce centralized task scheduling to the fuzzer, and they do find that it actually does increase performance beyond what you would expect. So ideal case, you would usually expect this to be fuzz with one core for four hours to be about the same in an ideal case as fuzzing with four cores for one hour. Uh, what they found instead was that using this, um, the fuzzing time is actually... It's uh, what they call a super linear acceleration. It goes beyond kind of what you would expect when you parallelize it. So four cores for one hour might be, you know, equivalent to the one core for five hours instead of four hours type, type deal. Uh, so it, it did have some actual results in doing this. I don't know. I mean, when you're talking about other fuzzers, doing a lot of fuzzers will break it down so that the actual instance is generating some of the cases to be tested. And it seems like that's for a performance reason. So doesn't he keep going back to a scheduler to get all the seats to test? Yeah, exactly. You're not losing time in the pipeline fetching cases. You're just generating them on the fly. Yeah, and they seem to be saying that ultimately you're getting a performance gain by centralizing that scheduler by centralizing that aspect so that it's not just left up to kind of having having all your instances kind of duplicate the work or potentially duplicate work so here's where i do kind of have a problem with uh, some of the you know tests they chose though is that that might very well be true when you're talking about hitting like libcxx or readelf or something like that 
if you try to apply this type of setup to like browser fuzzing or kernel fuzzing, I think you will find that it's not as effective because I mean, maybe not in browser fuzzing because I guess libcxx, you are kind of fuzzing it the same way. You're generating programs that'll, you know, try to induce a crash in the uh, C++ standard library. But, you know, especially when it goes to like kernel stuff and hypervisor stuff, um, ugh, it, generating test cases and running them and stuff it, logistically is very different than just passing, you know, binaries and and running them in a program. You know, it, it is there is a more complex setup involved there. And that's where I do question the F, like the efficiency of this type of setup in those types of environments. Obviously, you know, I can't I can only speculate um, they they didn't seem to really try those types of environments, which fair enough, you know they. I do think it's they worth the exploration, though. I mean, just because this did kind of come up with a non-intuitive result, you know, specifically that of acceleration. This wasn't just a linear grow. That fact alone kind of does make this interesting to me. One to see it reproduced. Um, and two, to see, as you're saying, like, does this apply when you have a much higher overhead on the actual, um, on the actual deployment of test cases on each, each test case takes a lot longer. Does this overhead actually have, or does reducing that overhead actually have an impact? You know, when you're doing a kernel fuzz, it might take a minute for the, uh, kernel to actually boot up. So that's really slowing down your test case time to the point where, is your scheduler really the bottleneck anymore? Yeah, not only boot up, every time you find an issue or a hang, you have to reboot it. So it's not like it's just a one-time initial overhead. It's, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing overhead um, yeah. that you'll encounter. So, yeah, like you said, the, the bottlenecks kind of change when you're looking at targeting different environments. Um, before we move on, though, I will, you know, kind of highlight, they have a nice little table on page 10. Um, that kind of goes into the vulnerabilities uh, that they found. Uh, that might be of interest to some people. A good deal of them were in libcxx. Um, stack overflows and the demangle um, section of it. So, you know, that little table there, if you're interested in the kinds of issues they found, uh, that's where, you know, you can find some information on those. Uh, that being said, we'll move into our last fuzzing topic, which is fans. Of course, we have to have more acronyms. Uh, with white papers. Um, so this is fuzzing Android native system services, which is where the FAMS comes from, uh, via automated interface analysis. So this dives into fuzzing Android and some of the unique barriers you can encounter there. Um, Android has a heavy reliance on IPC and service interf interfaces, such as Binder, which we've, uh, you know, we've covered a bit before with the blog post uh, from last year with the Project Zero exploit. So there's some challenges that come with hitting these interfaces. Um, you have multi-level interfaces. You need semantically correct input, kind of like what you do with like uh, language fuzzing, like with JavaScript and browser fuzzing. And you need to be able to extract the interface models. So this is the kind of work you would do before the fuzzer is ran in order to give it information it can use to build viable test cases. Um, and it, it's basically to facilitate structured input fuzzing. So you know, they compile the Android source and they run it through their tool. Um, and their tool specifically is basically to try to extract those interfaces and build dependency graphs and stuff like that. Um, they, they seem to be doing this at the source level. They do use the binary level a little bit for like resolving header dependencies and stuff like that. Um, but I know you were thinking this 2Z. This is basically like the Diffuse uh, paper we covered last year, but for Android services. So I don't think we actually covered Diffuse. We've talked about we it did. a lot, but it came out in 2018. So I don't think oh, maybe. I, I don't I, think we'd have covered it on the podcast at all. Okay, you know what it was? I think we covered a different fuzzing paper, which talked about Diffuse. And I think we talked about yeah, it Yeah, I think then. that's where I first kind of got turned on to Diffuse. Uh, thank you, Kubli, by the way, for the uh, tier one subscription and for two months. Yeah, um, awesome. But yeah, this reminded me a lot of Diffuse. So Diffuse, if you're not familiar with it, um, it attempted to do kind of ioctal fuzzing. So it would attempt to do a very similar thing where it would compile the Linux kernel, look at the compile commands, find all of the drivers or find a bunch of files there, find the drivers. Uh, find the commands uh, for the ioctals, 
Um, it would do a very similar processing as this one does, looking for switch statements. Uh, pull out all of the commands, find what type of structure it's reading things into. The, a very similar process uh, for ioctals as to what this is doing with the interfaces. Uh, it does differ in a few ways. That one focused on using LLVM IR uh, to pull out a lot of information, whereas this, like they compile it, but it looks like they only compile it to find what source files to use. They don't actually care about the whole compilation or they don't seem to actually use many of the many aspects of the binaries. Yeah, it's mostly source level parsing from uh, from what I could see. Yeah, that's what it stuff. seems to be. Uh, but basically that process, they look for this on transact method. If they find it, they try and look for any like switch statements. They look for the read and write in 32s and do some processing around the returns to detect um, uh, the transaction paths. Uh, so, I mean, they dig into a lot of the details on how they're doing each of these steps uh, in the actual paper. Uh, but I think that's kind of a fair overview. And then they just have their own fuzzer actually running on that. So, um, it's not only the paper that they release. They also have a GitHub repository, which uh, people might want to check out. Uh, they have their their interface model extractors and their fuzzing engine and all that stuff on GitHub. So I'll just pull that up on the stream. Um, it's all C++ basically. So, you know, it, it, it's probably reasonable to, uh, you know, get up and going if you wanted to try to use it and look into it a little bit more. Um, looking into the vulnerabilities that they mentioned that they found, many were in uh, native system services. Uh, you had to look into the white paper paper for this. I don't think they had them in the slides. Um, so they looked at like LibSensor, LibMedia DRM, StatsD, uh, StatsDame, and stuff like that. Um, a lot of null D references out of memory, so probably not really exploitable issues, but there were definitely some issues in there that were exploitable, like heap use after free and stack overflows, stuff like that. Uh, they go into deep detail on uh, three of them in the paper, uh, if you're interested. Uh, coming to my thoughts, though, I mean... I think it's cool. It seems like they're trying to solve a problem that hasn't been tackled publicly. Um, it's it's possible that, you know, something like this already existed in somebody's private setup or something like that. But um, and, you know, we kind of mentioned that the idea was already kind of there with like Diffuse, but it was never yeah, really I mean, applied I, to Android services. So that's where this kind of brings something new to the table. I mean, I doubt Diffuse was even the first one. I mean, this really comes down to trying to automate uh, the structure definition discovery. Uh, yeah. when it comes to fuzzing, which is a common task. It's always a dream to get as much of that automated as possible. But, like, it doesn't surprise me. But yeah, I do agree. There has at least been some some aspect of these services being a little bit overlooked in favor of other attack services. Uh, part of that being that these don't, you know, in an ideal case, you're just going to go for a kernel exploit and not even... Uh, mess around with these services these services generally speaking it seems will get you up to a system um is it system uid i think so i uh, think it's the system uid it's not like root like yeah, it's not, it's not NT root. system yeah um it, it's a little bit under but it is above kind of your user level access so you do have a little bit more access to some other things yeah almost root but not quite so usually you'd want to get right to root uh, and I think that's probably why this has been overlooked a bit, but as kernels getting more picked over, makes more sense to look here, which will then open up more attack service in the kernel. Specifically, the kernel attack surface that exposed to that's exposed to sandboxes is really getting picked over because your attack surface is already quite limited as is when you get into sandboxing. So, um, you know, that's why bugs that are hittable from the sandbox are so valuable and so rare. Um, so yeah, hitting these system services could be like a step in the chain, kind of. Um, but yeah, that I know we were kind of talking about that a little bit just because we were thinking about how you know useful hitting system services could be. I I do find it a bit unfortunate that uh, like I was I was trying to look for like concrete because I'm not entirely certain that all system services run as a system user. I imagine they probably do, but I couldn't really find anything concrete on that. I do wish. Maybe that Android or Google had a little bit more documentation on that aspect, but maybe that's just like a personal, you know, pet peeve, I guess. 
Yeah, I think to some extent it's also just that the um it, it it's very fluid, like they're constantly moving things into uh those services. It's not it's not a static area of the system. Yeah, uh, so I think it's that, more active in development. Yeah, makes documentation harder. Yeah, to be fair to uh to Google. So there was a lot of hype around this, um, especially in the reverse engineering discord. Microsoft announced Project OneFuzz, uh, which is a framework they dropped. Uh, they also have it open sourced on GitHub. It's not just this page. This is just a page we pulled up for the stream. Um, um, but basically, OneFuzz is used internally uh, by Microsoft for Edge, Windows, and other Microsoft products as well. And it provides some cool features uh, out of the box. Um, they have scalable fuzzing out of the box, uh, programmatic triaging and reproduction uh they claim it's a debuggable design, so you can kind of get a window, uh, like a view into um, multiple stages along the, the process, the fuzzing pipeline. Um, and it's also multi-platform, which is also pretty nice. You know, sometimes I, I think people probably assumed with it being Microsoft that it would have been like Windows only, which, you know, I mean, probably was a reasonable assumption. But no, it seems this is actually designed to be uh, with multi-platform support in mind. So... Something they said this could be useful for is creating unit tests with fuzzing instrumentation built in. So more on the development side, maybe, than the security side, um, which is actually kind of like an interesting thing I hadn't really thought about, you know, integrating fuzzing instrumentation like a SAN and code coverage and stuff like that with conventional unit tests. Um, but not just that, adding fuzzing to your software development lifecycle, I think is something companies need to adopt more often. Um, it is because fuzzing, I've kind of used the phrase before, but it is unreasonably effective. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with fuzzing, like getting it in there as part of your life cycle can tackle and find so many issues that would take a vulnerability researcher quite a bit of time to find if they're doing a manual assessment. Granted, it's not finding everything. You still need that manual assessment. But having that fuzzing in there to take care of so many of the low-hanging fruit, to take care of the things that can be easily discovered, just eliminates so many possible issues. That having it easily, easily able to be incorporated with your CI and CD is definitely like a positive step. And that's where I think Microsoft has really filled a gap here. You know, building an initial fuzzing setup, especially if your product is not like... Um doesn't have fuzzing set up for similar products can be a lot of like development overhead, which is probably why it's not really done. But what it seems like Microsoft's trying to do here is make it easier for, you know, people to start doing that. I mean, they, they even talked uh, about adding experimental support for this kind of stuff being added to visual studio, which I think is like a really awesome step to take. Um, so yeah, it's, it's written in rust. So, you know, it's good. Um, but one thing that is important to note is that this does have telemetry. You can turn it off, but this is one thing you'll definitely want to know about prior to using it, especially if you're using it outside of development and you're using it more for like security and stuff. Um, you you probably want to know about that telemetry. Um, you know, something like a fuzzer, you probably don't want that information being collected and sent back to Microsoft. Um, I don't think they really go too in depth on what's involved in that telemetry. Like it, it probably doesn't just send like reports and stuff back to Microsoft of the actual crashes it finds, but it might, you never know. Um, you'd have to look into the source to see, I guess, um, what that telemetry is actually doing. Overall though, uh, I think it's definitely a net positive. Um, it seems pretty awesome. I'll probably check it out. Um, I am not a huge rustation, so it, it might be a bit of a learning curve to actually you know, read the code base and maybe hack on it a bit. But, um, you know, I guess that, you know, Mike, we talked about it before, Microsoft and Google and all these big companies are kind of jumping on the Rust hype train. So probably makes sense to try to learn it more anyway, because I feel like it's probable that a lot of future releases are going to be Rust-based. That's a bit of a bold claim uh, for the you Rust so? adoption. I I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a fair claim. But it is a I'm, bit of a bold claim, too. Well, um... Especially you know, after Mozilla has seen all the cuts, so they are... I believe they're spinning off Rust now to its own foundation. I might be mistaken about that. I believe that's what's going on. 
I was about to mention that actually. That is one thing. I mean, it happened a while ago, so it's probably fair that we didn't really cover it on the podcast. But Mozilla did kind of was feeling some pressure, and they basically had to uh, really scale down. And uh, they were working on a Rust-based browser. I don't know why I can't remember the name of it right now. Servo. Servo. Yeah, um, that basically got tanked. Uh, that you know that that's gone. So. I think you're right. I think Mozilla is trying to get uh, the Rust Foundation like its own separate entity. I don't think development on Rust or anything is going to suffer from uh, Mozilla's kind of collapse, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think we we are seeing Microsoft really has an interest in uh, in Rust specifically. Um, so yeah, I mean, there was that uh, project. What was it? Project Verona? I think we talked about it last year. I mean, uh, that Microsoft... was like the experimental yes. thing that was based on Rust, right? Or something well, like that? Well, it definitely had some inspiration from Rust and other locations. But it does seem like Microsoft is exploring these other languages a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily point straight to Rust. I don't know. Maybe Microsoft is using Rust more than I've seen. I can't say I I uh, look into a lot. Um, out of chat, uh, JDog underscore HS is Rust is here. So yeah, I don't think Rust is going to disappear anytime soon um russ has definitely established itself uh well enough so like i'm not trying to argue that russ is going to disappear by any means i'm just you know raising a bit of a skeptical eye towards microsoft's adoption of it although in fairness i'm not against the idea it's not that i don't think it'll happen I'm just less confident that it is happening, but Rust is being adopted more often just in general. And uh, we can see that reflected in Microsoft. But yeah, bottom line, if you want to, you know, hack on this fuzzer and look into the source, you, you will need to understand Rust. And one thing, like, I'm not going to segue too far into like a Rust, uh, you know, discussion, I guess. But one thing with Rust that I think is kind of important to note is it's, it's kind of unlike other languages and that syntactically it's so weird that it's not easy to read if you don't know it. So if you, like a lot of languages are kind of C-like, I guess I would call it in the way that if you know a language like C or any language that's like C, all the other ones are kind of similar. They have their own like library functions and maybe slightly different syntax, but for the most part, it's pretty similar. With Rust, I find that's a little bit further from the case, um, which is why I think, uh, you know, I'll probably have to, get into learning a bit of Rust if I want to look at this code base, or I'll probably just be um, <laughs> totally lost on all the syntactical details. Yeah, I so. mean, speaking about the syntax, that's one of those things that I've kind of held, held as my thoughts being with Rust. It's doing some really cool things. It's been exploring some interesting areas. I always mention the borrow checker as one of those things. Oh, but it does have those rough edges around the syntax. And I feel like there might be some other new language that comes about that takes these ideas Russ has done, iterates on them. And I could see that, whatever that language turns out being, uh, to have a bit more of an impact. Um, that said, it's like Russ has been around for a while. That hasn't happened. So I want to say Zig is kind of similar in a way. Um, that's kind of a newer language. I think that was yeah, released in like 2015. I've actually been hearing about Zig a little bit too, but not so much in terms of adoption. Just, I know a fanboy over Zig. Yeah. Uh, that being said though, we'll, we'll move away from the, uh, the Rust podcast. Maybe we'll start a, a separate podcast just for Rust, you know, cause it's so secure and, uh, well, I guess we wouldn't really have anything to talk about then. So maybe not, but anyway, we'll move into shout outs. So, uh, this was... A, a kind of a fun story that uh, kind of blew up. And this was when you browse Instagram and find the former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott's password uh, or passport number. So, you know, this was the former Prime Minister of Australia. Um, it kind of touches more on OSINT than, uh, or like OPSEC, I guess, than, you know, technical security. But it's still like a very interesting read. It has some pretty funny points. Um, yeah, I, basically, it comes down to don't po post your boarding pass on social media. Yeah, I thought it was just a kind of fun read. I saw it this morning and figured I'd just give it a quick shout out on a technical level. It's nothing too crazy. Effectively, he just came down to, well, once you have the picture of the boarding pass, 
the booking reference, and then you can log in. Most airlines have some sort of login where you enter your last name plus the booking reference to manage your booking. In particular, Qantas Airline included some somewhat sensitive information, just in like a JSON blob, it looked like. Uh, that included the password number, which of course is generally you don't want to share it. Um, it's not quite as useful as some other numbers, but it was just an interesting story. It ends up with like how he got in contact, eventually ended up getting in contact with Tony Abbott himself. Um, and like the process of trying to report this issue and trying to report that this happened, that this information was exposed and all that. Just a fun read. I'm just giving it a shout out. You can give it a read if you want. I wanted to shout out a few of the funny quotes that I saw when I was reading it. Uh, there's definitely like some witty quotes in here. Like uh, for security reasons, we try to change our prime minister every six months and never use the same prime minister on multiple websites. Um, you know, programmers use inspect element to try to figure out how websites work. This is futile. Nobody, nobody can understand how websites work. You know, there's definitely some cheeky quotes in there that definitely add to the entertainment value when I was reading it. Um, but yeah, it is a, a bit of a long read. Like you can see this. I don't know if you can see the scroll bar on the stream really, but it does go pretty long. Um, but yeah, basically goes over trying to figure out, a, you know, if they committed a crime. I do find it interesting that the author apparently, did they ever contact the lawyer? I know they were talking about they probably should have contacted the lawyer, but I don't think they said they did. They so. do say that they had some free legal. Uh, well, I guess they don't say free, but that they did have some not legal advice. Um, okay. They did get some advice from legal assistance, it sounds like. It sounds like they did call. They just didn't like, pay a lawyer for their time. Um, and Regex Generator out of chat just mentions that there are whole Twitter feeds for like exposed credit cards, uh, drivers, nurse, job license, all that. Yeah, I actually, I remember the credit card wine making some waves back, like, yeah, when I was in my teens. Oh, uh, when that kind of one of those started off. I mean, yeah, people post stuff that should be private. That said, the boarding pass feels like it's it's a little bit less obvious what you could do with that and it did rely on Qantas airline actually exposing some sensitive information i mean with the boarding pass somebody could just go and cancel uh your flight and i think that has happened that would suck. before <laughs> that'd be that'd be quite a troll um yeah somebody I mean, posts it all excited because they're at the airport and then don't get to board yeah, um, I, mean, I think also J Dog. I think they actually mention that in this paper. They do go into some of the research about boarding passes. Um, in this, I guess said paper, but in this post. Oh no, like I said, I just thought it was a fun read this morning, so I wanted to give it the shout out on that, not because of the technical details within it. Uh, yeah, for those just listening, H Dog um basically just linked the three three C three talk. Um, so yeah. I mean, yeah, this is kind of a fun story. I guess there is kind of like a, you know, real world, you know, lesson to be learned there, though, is just there's no need to post these kinds of things on social media, even though you said like a boarding pass is a little bit less obvious and how damaging it can be. People are like way too, you know, easygoing when it comes to posting stuff on social media, like credit cards and boarding passes and passports and all this and driver's licenses and it just it doesn't there's no reason to do it really all it can do is hurt you so just don't do it um and just uh before we switch off this one i do also want to call out one feature of this website um which i think more places should adopt and that is the hard mode option which results in this lovely cursor trail, which obviously those of you listening can't see, but fruit will drop from your cursor as you move it around. It is a beautiful feature. It's like a fruit ninja type game. It's too bad you don't have to cut down the fruit before they reach the bottom of the page or the page goes away or something. That'd be a fun little feature to add. You know, if uh, Mango, .pd, uh, Mango PDF is uh, listening, you know, that, that could be something to add to that feature. Um, but yeah, we'll move into some some more serious shout outs, I guess. Um, Arm64. So this is like a three-part blog series that uh, you found interesting, Z. Yeah. Um, I haven't been through all of it. That said, I have been looking at kind of 
getting into some of the arm exploitation, and I just happened to see this link earlier in the week. Um, and it seems like it's a fairly well-written cover of some basic arm exploitation, and has a lot of background information that you'd kind of want getting into it. So, like I said, there are three parts, so we just have the first part up here um, on the stream itself, but... Yeah, oh no, it just looked interesting. Like I said, I haven't been through all of it. I do want to kind of work through it, though. Uh, Spectre, I think you had looked at one part of it, though, and you had a criticism, I think, around the ROP stuff. Yeah, so first I'll say that where this really provides value, I think, is it's talking about ARM64. And when I was trying to look around, because I have been like looking at getting into ARM for a while. I've been saying for like two years that I've been going to look into it, but just lying, of course. Um, but now I'm I'm actually trying to look into it, and a lot of resources out there are focusing on ARM v7 and lower, which is ARM32. And there is quite a difference between ARM32 and ARM64, like there is with x86 and x86-64. So, you know, that that's where this kind of adds a resource to the pile for the uh, the ARM64 stuff. Uh, like you said, I, I did look at, I think it's the second part where they talk about, uh, you know, return-oriented programming which is obviously very interesting when you get to ARM, because with x86, uh, ROP is not really that difficult when you consider that you have the ability to jump into instructions midstream, because they have variable instruction sizes, it's a complex instruction set, um, there's so many hidden instructions um, embedded in the encoding between instruction boundaries. <clears throat> in ARM, you don't have that, because you have fixed instruction uh, sizes, your instruction accesses have to be aligned to, like, a two bytes or whatever, I guess, because of thumb as well. So you can't just jump into instructions midstream. So ROP gets a little bit harder when you talk about ARM. The method they used was actually abusing a function prolog. So using, like, jumping into a function prolog, but not at the very top of it, a little bit uh, further into it, so that you can use that to get control of the stack pointer, which I thought was kind of an interesting way of going about it. Um, the problem with that, though, is you do need to go into a full function call to be able to do that. So you might not always be able to pull off that trick. That's kind of where I was... Uh, I, I don't know if it's really criticism, but it is just one thing to note with that, you know, uh, decision they made there. Overall, though, I think, you know, I didn't read all the parts, but the part I did read, uh, part three, I thought it was part two, my bad. Um, I think it is very, like well-written and accessible to somebody who's new to ARM. So I really like that aspect. Yeah, Did you have anything more to say on the uh, blog post? No, I mean, that's pretty much the sense that I got from when I looked at it. So figured we'd share it here. Yeah. Um, there is one other shout out that I had that I unfortunately lost the link for and uh, didn't add in there, I, although I do have it from history. Thank you. Uh, thank you, history feature. So I'll bring that up real quick. Um, basically, it's just a Twitter event that uh, this uh, Eliza person, Eliza Azage, I think you say. Um, they they basically compiled a list of the tweets and stuff that they had for um, researching into hypervisor exploitation. So it's not necessarily new. Uh, there's some stuff in this thread that's from like August and even going back to like uh, last year and stuff like that. Um, but that's not to say that it's not still relevant. And I think it might be interesting for those out there that are looking to break into researching hypervisors because hypervisors are kind of, they seem really hard to break into. People kind of treat them as like magic boxes. There's not a ton of documentation on them. They're kind of these closed source black box magic things so you know any resources on hypervisor exploitation i like to shout out just because it's cool and you don't always get to see stuff like that so i think this uh this event is definitely worth shouting out for people who are interested in that so that basically concludes all of our shout outs and the show um thanks to everyone who tuned in you can catch the vods on twitch or on youtube 24 hours after the stream we also had previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, more links on Anchor. We will not have a discussion video coming out this week, but we will have one coming out the week after uh, because we're currently on a uh, bi-weekly schedule for those um, to hopefully transition to a weekly schedule at some later point. Um, other than that, though, we'll be back next Monday uh, at the same time for the podcast, episode 46 at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, and uh, we will see you guys then.